Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this episode is the Top 5 Turning Points in Medieval Ireland, Part 2. In Part 1, which was released last week, we traced our way through nearly three centuries of Irish history, stopping off at the battlefields of Ballymoon and Tara. Then we accompanied Brian Boru on his great conquest of Ulster and finally took a look at the disastrous Siege of Dublin in 1171. In this show, we bring this journey through our medieval past to an end at the Battle of Athenry in 1316. Now, to get to the Battle of Athenry, we need to take a circuitous route, beginning in medieval Scotland. Then we will join a massive invasion force of Scots who land in Ulster in 1315. After many twists and turns, we will arrive at Athenry on the 10th of August, 1316. Along the way, we will meet some of the most fascinating characters from medieval history. Some who you will have heard of, like William Wallace, also known as Braveheart, and Robert the Bruce. Others less well known, like William Lea de Berg. The Battle of Athenry, one of the bloodiest conflicts in medieval Ireland, had its origins not only in long-running tensions in Ireland, but also in Scotland. And so, our journey to Athenry on that momentous day in August 1316 begins 20 years earlier in Scotland in March 1296, when tensions between the King of England and the King of Scotland finally gave way to war. These wars, known to history as the First Scots War of Independence, would last over 20 years, drawing to a conclusion in 1328, only after Scotland, and as we shall see, large parts of Ireland had been destroyed. Now this war was marked by horrendous barbarism. In 1297, after the English official Hugh of Cressingham was killed, his corpse was skinned by the Scots. William Wallace, also known as Braveheart, reputedly wore a sword belt made from Cressingham's skin. Not to be outdone, when the English got their hands on William Wallace, he was taken to London and hanged, drawn and quartered in front of a mob in Smithfield. Indeed, it was only in 1306 that a Scots leader emerged who could hang on to power and his head. This man was Robert the Bruce, who seized the throne after, unsurprisingly, he brutally murdered a rival in an abbey of all places. Now at this point, you might be wondering what all this madness has to do with Ireland. During this period... Over half of Ireland was under Norman rule and subject to the kings of England and accordingly contributed vast amounts of resources to Edward's campaigns to crush the Scots. In years of major military campaigns, ship after ship left Irish ports with grains, men and material to support Edward's armies. However, it would not be too long before this war spilled over into Ireland and would lead directly to the Battle of Athenry in 1316. Now, the help sent from Ireland did seem to be having the desired effect when the English invaded Scotland yet again in 1314 and seemed to be getting the upper hand. However, in this campaign, the Scottish King Robert the Bruce inflicted a catastrophic defeat on the English at the Battle of Bannockburn. After this, a stalemate ensued. Neither side was able to take decisive action. Bruce didn't have the resources to invade England, while it would take the English themselves years to recover after Bannockburn. It was in this climate that Robert the Bruce turned his gaze west to the Norman colony in Ireland, the base from which so many of the armies that had invaded Scotland had been supplied. He had long-running amicable relations with the powerful Gaelic king of Western Ulster, Don O'Neill, who equally despised the Normans. Indeed, O'Neill had gone as far as to offer the High Kingship of Ireland to Robert the Bruce's brother, Edward, if the Scots would come to Ireland and help drive out the Normans. For the Scots, after Bannockburn, this was an increasingly tantalising offer. If their armies could destroy the Norman colony in Ireland, not only would it undermine the English king Edward II's ability to make war, but it would also open up the potential of invading England through Wales. Last but not least, it would also export the horrors of war 
from Scotland and dumped them in Ireland. So it was that on May 26th, 1315, Edward the Bruce, brother of the King of Scotland, landed on the east coast of Ireland with around 6,000 men. This was unquestionably the biggest threat the Normans in Ireland had ever faced. This invasion force started a war that would lead directly to the Battle of Athenry over a year later, an event which changed the course of the invasion. But before we race ahead, we need to trace what happened to these 6,000 men who had just invaded Ireland. Edward Bruce, despite the large army he had, faced a staunch test from the moment he landed in Ireland. Eastern Ulster was the territories of the Earl of Ulster and Lord of Connacht, Richard de Burgh, the most powerful noble in Ireland. De Burgh and his cousin William are crucial to our story, so I'm going to take a moment to explain these intriguing characters. Richard de Burgh was 56 in 1315 and was the most powerful noble in Ireland and arguably even Britain. He had spent most of his teenage years in England, where he had married a relative of the Queen, before returning to Ireland in 1286. Incredibly powerful, he ruled the vast holdings in the north in the Earldom of Ulster and in the west in the Lordship of Connacht. Such was his prestige that many of his children married the leading nobles of the day. Edward Bruce, who had just landed in his earldom in 1315, was only too aware of his reputation. His brother, Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland, had married none other than one Elizabeth de Burgh, the Earl's daughter. A man Edward Bruce would have known far less, but plays a key role in our story, is the Earl's cousin, William Leah de Burgh. William Leah de Burgh was a very different figure compared to his cousin, the Earl. He was almost certainly brought up in the west of Ireland. There he married a Gaelic woman, Fanola O'Brien, from the ruling dynasty of the O'Briens. While many families in this period were plagued by jealousy and rivalry between leading family members, these two cousins, Richard and William, formed one of the most effective relationships of the medieval period. The Earl allowed William Leah to rule over the family lands in the west of Ireland, which was an incredibly complex web of alliances. You see, Norman colonisation in the west of Ireland had been patchy at best, and the de Burghs had no choice but to negotiate with the dominant Gaelic families, particularly the O'Connors. In order to preserve de Burgh power, William Leah had even fought in several civil wars within the O'Connor family, supporting favourable candidates to the de Burgh interests. While the Earl may have been Lord of Connacht in name, the historian Rona Mackay has accurately described William Leah as the actual Lord of Connacht. While Edward Bruce may not have known William Leah de Burgh, he would soon be acquainted with his military prowess. The Earl himself wasn't in Ulster or immediately left when Edward Bruce landed and instead went to his cousin in the west of Ireland to raise an army. Raising an army in medieval Ireland was a slow business. This gave Bruce the chance to link up with the Gaelic Irish O'Neills who had invited him originally to Ireland. They crowned him King of Ireland but it should be noted this was a tenuous claim at best. He received very little support outside of Ulster. Regardless, after his inauguration, Bruce captured most of Norman Ulster before the de Burgh cousins could act. However, by July, Richard de Burgh was gathering a major army around him in Roscommon in North Connacht. Now, choosing Roscommon was an ideal location. Not only were there crossing points over the Shannon, but it was close to the heartland of the Gaelic-Irish O'Connors, who at this time were ruled by the young 22-year-old Phelim O'Connor. Phelim was indebted to William Leah, who had helped him take the throne, and now William called on him to serve the Earl. So, after being joined by a sizeable O'Connor force led by Phelim, the de Burghs moved across the Shannon and towards Ulster. En route, they fatally rejected the offer of help from another Norman army, and pursued Bruce deep into the north of Ireland through what was a famine-ravaged countryside. The worst famine of the medieval period had started in 1315. In the following weeks, 
these two armies destroyed Ulster like two plagues of locusts moving across the landscape, sucking up what little food there was. No doubt the starving population of Ulster just wished these two armies would get on with it and join battle. At least then they'd have half the mouths to feed. After several weeks of what was shadow boxing, the de Burgh and Bruce armies fought a major battle on the 10th of September 1315 at Connor in County Antrim. The result was as shocking as it was calamitous for Anglo-Norman Ireland. The de Burgh army, hampered by defections, was crushed, and worse still for the Anglo-Normans in Ireland, the Scots captured William Leah de Burgh. While the injured William Leah was put on board ship and sent to Scotland, Norman Ireland now faced catastrophe. Bruce increased his grip on Ulster, where only three castles, most notably the garrison of Carrickfergus, held out. He then began to push south from Ulster towards the lordships of Trim and Meath. With no army to stop him, he burned on dock and destroyed huge tracts of farmland. The Normans in Ireland, long racked by divisions, now looked like a sports team, reeling from having a man sent off since the all-powerful de Burghs had been effectively removed from playing an active role, for the time being at least. The remaining Normans were totally disorganised and began blaming each other. Things went from bad to worse. While the odds were always against the Scots, who were fighting a war overseas, in late 1315, the situation was nothing short of dire for the Anglo-Norman colony in Ireland. Through the final months of the year, the Scottish army rampaged across Ireland, unchecked, and easily swept aside another army that attempted to block their path at Kells in December 1315. By the close of the year, the future of Anglo-Norman Ireland now hung in the balance. At this stage, it seems, the Earl of Ulster may well have been going through some sort of nervous breakdown. He was described in the annals of Loch Key as a wanderer throughout Erin without sway or power. With the only man who could have held de Burgh power together in prison, this obviously being William Leah, de Burgh rule came under attack. These two cousins were no longer the feared duo they had once been. The Gaelic Irish, long oppressed and disenfranchised by the Norman invasion, took advantage of the crisis facing the colonists. In the west, the O'Connors, who had been allies of the de Burghs purely for strategic reasons, now saw a chance for power and rebelled. Phelan O'Connor, reneging any allegiance he had to the de Burgh family, proclaimed himself King of Connacht and King of Ireland as well. He clearly had designs on power beyond Connacht, but first he would need to deal with the Normans in the west of Ireland. Soon, Balaam burned and pillaged his way across the province, destroying Norman settlements. With the colonial authorities in Dublin still trying to get to grips with Edward Bruce's force, the Normans in the west were alone for the time being at least, and many suffered horrendous consequences. Through 1316, Phelan's power continued to grow and Norman Ireland in the face of Bruce's aggression and Phelan's reconquest of Connacht was shrinking fast. It's worth noting that there's no evidence that Phelan was in league or supportive of Bruce. Both men were rival claimants to the high kingship. However, from a Norman perspective, whether in league or acting independently, the two men and their allies posed the greatest threat Norman Ireland had ever seen. Whether the colony would survive was by no means certain. While there were preparations being made in Dublin in 1316 to strengthen the Norman forces facing Bruce, little appears to have been done to resolve the increasingly desperate situation in the west of Ireland. No doubt few wanted to venture across the Shannon where they would have to fight Phelan on what was his home turf in an inhospitable landscape crisscrossed with mountains, bogs, rivers and lakes. However, Phelan's revolt would eventually have consequences beyond the Shannon. They would have to deal with this man. He was claiming the high kingship and no doubt serving as an inspiration for the many Gaelic families in revolt. There were few though who could fight and win a war against Phelan in the West. Indeed arguably there was only one Norman with the experience to do so. This was William Leah de Burgh. He had grown up in the west of Ireland, lived and indeed fought many wars in its hills and mountains. 
Not only did he have many allies among the Normans, but he could also rally some of the Gaelic Irish of the province, in particular some of his wife Finola's family, the O'Briens. Indeed, he probably even knew Phelan personally, having been instrumental in his coming to power in 1309. It was clear, if the Normans wanted to win in the West, this man was needed back on the ground in Connacht. Regardless of the costs, he would have to be freed from his captivity in Scotland. This led to one of the most callous, treacherous and brutal acts of the entire war. Before we look at this, we'll take a quick break. Let's get back to the 14th century and the freeing of William Lear de Burgh from his prison cell in Scotland. As the Normans in the West grew desperate in that summer of 1316, there were others in a worse position, most notably the garrison of Carrig Fergus Castle, who were still holding out in Ulster, loyal to the de Burgh cause. Supplied intermittently by the sea, the Scots had failed to capture the fortress, despite a siege that had dragged on for almost a year. In July 1316, as six food ships were being prepared in Drogheda to be shipped to the starving and beleaguered garrison, the Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burgh, accompanied by William Lear de Burgh's one-year-old son, Edmund, arrived in the Riverine port. Instead of ensuring the fleet got to the starving castle, which had shown the Earl such great loyalty, he instead directed the food ships to Scotland with the one-year-old child, Edmund de Burgh, on board. An arguably treasonous move, this was part of a secret deal that saw William Lear de Burgh freed. The infant son, Edmund, was part of the deal. He had to take his father's place in custody in Scotland. This was in effect an insurance policy demanded by the Scots to bind William Lear to a promise he had made not to fight the Scots in Ireland if freed. Brutal as this was, it successfully secured the release of William Lear de Burgh in the summer of 1316. One wonders, when the child Edmund grew up, did he feel resentment to his father and his father's cousin the Earl, who played politics with his life? Incidentally, Edmund would live to the age of 60, becoming a major figure in Irish politics in his own right but he was forever more known as Edmund Albanach, or Edmund the Scot, after this incident. The freeing of William Leah proved decisive on so many levels. Perhaps the most immediate and obvious implication was for the soldiers holed up in Carrick Fergus Castle. Starving without the supplies that had been shipped to Scotland instead, they were reduced to eating some Scots prisoners before eventually surrendering in autumn 1316, thereby concluding the longest siege in Irish history. However, it was in the West where the full ramifications of his return was felt. Scarcely back in Ireland a few weeks, William Lea de Burgh had crossed the Shannon and was doing what he had been free to do, raising an army amongst the Normans and loyal Gaelic Irish of the West to take on Phelan. On hearing William Lea had crossed the Shannon and raised an army, there was only one option open to Phelan. It was obvious one of these two men would die in the following months and he decided he would take the initiative. Situated in North Connacht, when he received this news, Phelan immediately called his forces and marched south to the Norman town of Athenry in South Galway. It seems by this stage Phelan was relatively successful in gaining wider acclaim for his kingship because he was joined by the Gaelic Irish from Meath and Munster. This army he brought to face William de Burgh was one of the largest ever raised by a Gaelic king since the Norman invasion. By early August, William Lear de Burgh had raised an army with Richard de Birmingham, the Baron of Athenry. It was obvious that outside the small settlement of Athenry, the fate of Connacht at the very least would be decided, but the effects of the upcoming battle would be felt across Ireland and even in Scotland and England. Should Phelan win, the remaining towns across the west of Ireland would clearly burn. However, should de Burgh prevail, the O'Connors would pay a heavy, heavy price for their rebellion. On August 10th, 1316, two great armies drew up against each other. The Normans, supported by some loyal Gaelic Irish, 
against Phelim with an army drawn from across Ireland with cohorts travelling from as far afield as Munster and Meath. What transpired was one of the biggest battles of medieval Irish history and noted by contemporaries as a particularly bloody affair. By the day's end, on a blood-soaked field overshadowed by the recently constructed walls of Athenry, William Leah de Burgh, that man whose freedom had been valued at more than the entire garrison of Carrick Fergus Castle, defeated Phelim O'Connor's army. The defeat was as complete as it was bloody. An anonymous poet, quoted in the Annals of Connacht, reminisced, Many of the men of all Ireland lay dead about that great field, many a king's son, who I name not, of the Mead and Munster hosts, was filled in that great rout, my heart rused the fight. The annals kept at St Mary's Cistercian Abbey in Dublin claimed, of the Irish, over 11,000 fell on the sword near Athenry. While this is undoubtedly an exaggeration, one of those who definitely fell on the sword was Phelan O'Connor. His death brought to an end the most substantial Gaelic revolt since the Norman invasion. In the following weeks, to follow up on his victory, William de Burgh invaded O'Connor territory, punishing the survivors. The defeat of Phelan O'Connor pacified a huge portion of Ireland from a Norman perspective, ending the possibility of facing a two-front war from the O'Connors in the west and the Bruces in the north. It also eliminated an even more terrifying, if unlikely, vista that these two kings would find common cause. While this ended the O'Connor challenge, I would argue it was akin to a Stalingrad for the Bruce invasion, which in 1315 had threatened the very existence of Norman Ireland. Even though there were no Scots on the field and Edward Bruce probably had little idea that this battle was even occurring until it was long over, the defeat of Phelan O'Connor made victory for him nigh on impossible. By the summer of 1316, the Bruce's campaign was already floundering and desperately in need of allies outside of Ulster. In February, Edward Bruce had come up against a major Norman force and only held the field because of disunity among the Anglo-Normans in Ireland. Afterwards, serious discussions had taken place in Dublin to resolve these tensions and it was clear he would now face a far more united enemy. To make matters worse, Roger Mortimer, the Lord of Trim, had raised an army in England which arrived in Ireland in early 1317. After Athenry, Bruce was deprived of potential allies. Indeed, while William Lea de Burgh held to his pledge not to fight the Scots directly in Ireland, at Athenry he inflicted more damage than many Norman lords who actually took the field against them. The full impact of the Battle of Athenry on Bruce was seen in 1317, when his army invaded south from Ulster for a third time. Increasingly harried by the justiciar, Edmund Butler, they made their way to Limerick, hoping to link up with the forces of Donna O'Brien, west of the Shannon. This was not to be. Instead, Edward Bruce reached the Shannon only to face the army of Donna O'Brien's rival, Murkertoch O'Brien, one of the few Gaelic Irish who had fought with William Leah at Athenry. With no hope of allies, the Bruce army returned to Ulster, but it was clear the tide was turning. The next time they ventured south from Ulster was in autumn 1318, but they didn't get very far. Edward Bruce was defeated and killed at the Battle of Fahart by the forces of John de Birmingham. While the victory of William Lea de Burgh at Attenry was a key event in defeating the Bruce invasion, it also had a massive impact on the west of Ireland. It destroyed the O'Connors as a major power for a generation. And, even when they did re-emerge, they would never again politically assert themselves in such concerted fashion. This brings an end to our whistle-stop tour through medieval Ireland. Over the past two shows, we have seen the top five medieval turning points as I see them. The Battle of Ballymoon, the Battle of Tara, Brian Boru's conquest of Ulster, the Siege of Dublin in 1171, and then, in this show, the Battle of Athenry in 1316. Now, if you think I've left something out, let me know by emailing me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, slán. <laughs>